Okay, <clears throat> here's lecture 12. And uh, in the previous lecture, we learned that from the study of equivalent principle of physics, for example, gravitational time dilation, Einstein was inspired to propose that the curve space time uh, as the gravitational field. And then this nat natural led to that's the gravitational equation motion being the geodesic equation. It was the straightest uh, possible curve in the curve space and time. And in this lecture, we we'll continue to discuss the geodesic equation for a while. And then we're going to start in chapter six, talking about GR field equation, and also going to have short introduction of the curvature. Uh, uh, in the uh, uh, when we talk about weak equivalent principle, the fact that inertia mass equal to gravitational mass, so therefore we have this mass cancellation in the gravitational uh, equation motion. So this equation becomes totally independent of any particles of any property of the test particle. This suggests to Einstein that the gravitational field, unlike other force fields, is related to some fundamental feature of space and time. And then naturally that's the idea that the gravitational equation motion, you know, it's the equation that governs the motion of test particle in the gravitational field, is simply is the uh, geodesic equation. The geodesic being the straightest, pos shortest possible curve in the curve space and time. Now, of course, this is just a heuristic suggestion. Uh, we will strengthen this by a formal derivation uh, in chapter 11 when we learned uh, to do tensor analysis in general totally. Now, I'm going to give a work out an example to the main purpose of this to, uh, to, to talk about geodesic in space time. And the main point is so that you will confuse with the geodesic in three, di three dimensional space. Uh, consider we're throwing an object up to the height 10 meters and over distance 10, uh, also 10 meters. So this is 10, this is 10. So, of course, this is just a parabola in the xy plane, uh, the spatial trajectory. But when we talk about geodesic, we're talking about uh, space time, so therefore we're interested in the world line of this particle. The world line of this particle going from origin to the, this one, its projection on the xy plane is the parabola we talked about. Okay. <clears throat> now, space time diagram, the time axis is multiplied by c, so therefore we need to multiply the time the particle was in the air by a factor c. Now, object takes 1.4 seconds to reach the height and 2.8 seconds for the whole up and down trip. So you multiply that 2.8 by c, you get something like uh, uh, 10 million kilometers, okay, more than the round trip on Earth. So there was the space diagram. This point here is way, way, way up there. Okay, so uh, so when this stretched out. Uh, this is only 10 meters uh, to, to a very straight line, a uh, straight geodesic. Well, but the main point here is not so much the straightness of the world line or the geodesic, which reflects practically the flat space time in a very weak uh, gravitational field of the Earth. Remember that the gravitational potential of Earth divided by c squared is something like 10 to the minus 10. Uh, we encounter that in the <coughs> Uh, when we talk about the gravitational time dilation of power replica experiment. The point is that we must not be confused with trajectory. This uh, this world line, when we talk geodesic in space time, we talk about the world line. We're not talking about the trajectory in the three dimensional space. Okay. So, now, to say that we, geodesic is uh, uh, is the equation motion for uh, for GR theory, uh, we can strengthen that by say, showing that uh, 
this equation H contains Newton's equation motion. In other words, here's the geodesic equation. And in the appropriate limit, it will reduce to Newton's equation motion, which is just, remember, just the acceleration equals the minus uh, gradient of the gravitational potential, which is just the gravitational acceleration. And uh, uh, so the question, what limit we must take so that this will reduce to this equation? Turns out that limit is, is called the Newtonian limit. It's the limit of when the test particle moving with non relative velocity. So V of a particle is much less than C. And traveling in a weak and static gravitational field. Okay, it's not just any gravitational, but weak static gravitational field. Then the <coughs> geodesic equation reduced to Newton's equation motion. Okay, let's let's work out this limit. Uh, the three parts. So first part, is the particle test particle moving with no relative velocity. So dxi dt is much less than c, or another way to say, dxi is much less than ct. Now, if we divide by the proper time or parameter interval d tau, so therefore this equation, dxi d tau much less c dt d tau, but c times dt is the x naught. So therefore, the one to three component is much less than the zero components. Now, <coughs> so so in the Judas equation, we have all these t x t tau t x t tau. So therefore, we only need to keep the zero component because the dominant terms are the zero component. So in this double sum over rho and eta, we only keep keep the zero uh, component, which is reduced to this. So it was the approximation particle moving with no relative velocity tells you I only need to consider this part of the uh, geodesic equation. And also we said the part Newton limit is the gravitational field is static, which means the gravitational, uh, uh, the metric for the gravitational field, which is space and time, when different respect to time is equal to zero. And so therefore, if since all these derivatives back to uh, and if I take a, a, the eta equals zero, because we're interested in the uh, crystal symbol, the new zero zero component. So, so rho equals the zero, sigma equals zero. So these two terms are different with respect to time. So in the static field, the first term vanishes. So there's only the last term left. So therefore, the Christopher symbol with new zero zero component can be written as just this though. Then the third condition is the gravitational is weak, which can be expressed to say that uh, the metric tensor for the gravitational field it doesn't deviate that much from the flat space time metric. So, so G mean you can written as the flat space eta mean plus a small correction. Okay. So that's an expression for a weak field. Now, so now we're going to talk about uh, how to evaluate the first components of uh, uh, the Christopher symbol nu zero zero. We remember that eta mu nu this f is constant, so therefore differentiate that equals zero. So when we differentiate with the g mu nu, this term is not there, so it's the same as just differentiate to h uh, mu sigma. Okay. Now so. So therefore, this derivative term is necessary order h, and the g have can be one and, and order h. But since uh, if I include the h term in the in the metric tensor here, I will get high order h squared term. So therefore, the leading term I can I can approximate the g mu nu term here by eta mu nu, okay? Because this is zero order because this is already first order. If I include the h, will be will be second order. So. So for the leading order, I only need to talk eta mu nu for the coefficient. And then you work out for the zero component. And of course, then diagonally, the mu has to be zero. So therefore, just, just because zero means difference between time. And we say static field, so this equals zero because uh, the correction term is also independent of time. And uh, nu equal to i, the one, two, three term, just written out here. Because then the delta 
uh, ij becomes the uh, quantical delta. So these are the main part of the question in the in the neutral limit we need to consider. I just copied over here. So now we still have four equations. The index nu can be zero, can be one, two, three. When it equals zero, this equation because now uh, the Christoph symbol is zero, zero, zero is zero. So therefore, the second term vanishes, and the first term is just the second respect to uh, curve par parameter, and which means the first derivative respect to curve parameter is constant. Okay. Now remember, when we talk about normal relative the particle velocity, this term is the dominant term. So therefore, when we talk the dependence of of uh, 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 whatever quality we differentiate is through the x. So x mu you use when I this x mu x mu, but in the sum only the zero term dominates. So I can just replace by just only keep the x naught term. And this in fact is constant, so I can pull it out. So, so second with respect to the tau is equal to second with respect to coordinate time multiplied by dx naught d tau squared. Okay. Now for the new equal to i, the one to three part equation, I have just replaced new by i. Okay. And i is this term here. And uh, we learned from the first term that this is the second derivative respect to tau is just second derivative respect to x naught, which this factor out, fact out. But the second term we already have dx naught over d tau, so both have dx naught d tau factor out. So the coefficient is just the second derivative respect to time plus the Christopher symbol i zero zero. But i zero zero is different with respect to the h naught naught. So, so this is, so, so I can cross out this term, I get the uh, geodesic equation reduced to this one. But g0, 0 equal to this, we have derived before. Now, in terms of correction terms, is minus 1 plus h naught naught. So therefore, h naught naught is just minus 2 phi over c squared. So I plug in c squared cancel, and uh, so the second is back to time is equal to the gradient of the gravitational potential. And that, of course, is just an Newtonian equation motion. Okay. So therefore, the, the geodesic equation does reduce to Newton equation motion when we take the Newtonian limit, which is three parts, non relative velocity, weak field, and static field. So, Knowing this Newton limit, we can understand the relation. In what sense, Einstein theory is the extension of Newton theory? Okay, because GI extends to the case when gravitation is strong, and can have time dependence, and allow for particle with speed close to speed of light. Now, when we say the gravitational field is strong, what does it mean by this? Remember the gravitational potential zero zero equal to one plus h zero zero. So therefore, to say remember to say this weak means this has to be less than order one. So strong is this order one. Okay, order one means this this h over the gravitational potential over c squared is order one. Now, for example, uh, what kind of gravitation will give order one? Let's say they compare with the, the case on Earth. The gravitational potential on Earth is, is gravitational acceleration times the radius of Earth, which comes up to uh, 10 million uh, meter square over C square, uh, over S square. So, therefore, the gravitational potential divided by C square, which is factor uh, 10 to the 17 meter square over S square. So, therefore, this divided by 10 to the uh, 17, so it's really on order 10 to the 10. So in other words, when we talk about gravitation to be order one, we talk about a gravity that's 10 billion g. Okay. Remember, we talk about uh, uh, spaceship coming down. You have 2g, 3g, 4g. Now, if we talk about 10 billion g, only then we consider gravitation to be strong.
And also, the time dependence of gravitational we, we to talk about gravitational uh, waves. Uh, anyway, so far we only talked about gravitational equation motion. Now we're going to start chapter 6 uh, talking about gravitational field equations. This first part of lecture 12, we'll stop here. <clears throat>